Good morning, everyone, and thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, on behalf on, of EFLA Journal editors, uh, Shelly Shang and I myself, I want to give you a warm welcome to this, uh, to this EFLA Journal meeting and hope you will get a great, uh, you, uh, and hope you will get a great um, efforts and some great uh, expectation and all your doubts can be solved during this uh, presentation. I think that everything starts with an idea, a problem, some curiosity about the subject, sometimes with question, lack of knowledge of some phenomena, or after reading a paper, what would be the result in my context? Having solved this curiosity as academics, we always want to share our, finding, our findings with our colleagues in seminar, congress, or as, a, or as a paper in a scientific journal. The big question always is how and where to communicate our findings. The aim of this webinar is to provide guidance on being published in academic and professional journal with a particular focus on IFLA journal. So uh, you will gain some insight on topics of choosing a journal, the editorial and peer review process, IFLA journal scope and content, and author's experience for publishing through the peer reviewing process. For this, I'm very honored to present our speakers who will be share with us the process and their experience with communications in IFLA journals, in IFLA journal. I will share with you to do. So uh, we will present the FLA journal editorial committee, how to get uh, published in scholarly journals, uh, firstly the Americas. And this event is being recorded including, including chats, microphones have been muted for this event. A question or comments, please type into the chat or Q&A box. And so our, one of our speakers is Dr. Steve Wade. He is IFLA journal's editor, head, head uh, of the area of study library and associate professor, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And afterwards, we will have uh, Debbie Rabina. She is professor at the School of Information at Pratt, Univer Pratt Institute, U uh, USA. And uh, last but not least, we have Sherry Ann Smart, CIO, uh, Information Smart Consulting of Jamaica. Uh, Steve, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Egbert. Uh, thank you for the, the, the warm welcome and introduction. Um, I'm Steve Witt. I'm the editor of If the Journal, and I'll be uh, sharing with you um, uh, my screen. Egbert, can you uh, allow me to share my screen? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's okay, Steve. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, it's still disabled. Now it's done. Ah, yes. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much again. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I'm the, the editor of If the Journal. I've been editing the journal uh, for the past uh, six years. Um, and today I, I'll be sharing with you uh, some insights I've gained uh, over the years as the journal editor, uh, and then also uh, provide uh, information about uh, the journal itself uh, and our, our publishing process. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so the, the first question um, that we have to address, and that's one that that Egbert uh, nicely summarized for us as well, is uh, why uh, does journal publishing matter, um, and and why we might want to publish our work um, uh, in if a journal. Um, uh, there's no, uh, there's only one question say no title. Ah, okay. Let me try the screen sharing. Very strange. Okay. Okay. Uh, there we go. Somehow it became paused. Um, so uh, the question of why uh, journal publishing is important. Um, uh, as we know, lots of research is taking place um, uh, and, and being presented. Um, and, and, and sometimes we want our, our research to be presented to a, a broader audience, a, a broader context uh, than our local uh, area or, or regional associations. Uh, and, and so uh, publishing uh, in an academic journal provides that venue. Uh, for uh, joining uh, those conversations. Um, so it's important uh, uh, for us uh, when we're thinking of, uh, of, of journals to, to, to consider our own uh, perspectives um, uh, and, and the fact that it's important uh, for our profession uh, to be able to provide local, regional, uh, national, and, and cultural specific perspectives to our peers so that we can all uh, learn from one another uh, and develop uh, our profession and our, and our work. Uh, uh, so so it, it's quite important as, as a way to, to establish an evidence base uh, for, for, for knowledge and, and our profession. Uh, and of course, uh, for some of us, uh, uh, we benefit uh, our employers, uh, 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 appreciate seeing us uh, present uh, our, our work in academic papers uh, and our university's rankings uh, in academic context are, are influenced by uh, where we publish. Uh, and we publish. And I think some people have their microphone on. If you could mute your microphone, that would be. Uh, so uh, as you're thinking about publishing, uh, you need to uh, consider the journal uh, that you're going to choose. Um, and as you're doing that, you, you need to think about the conversation uh, that you're joining. Um, and uh, who it is that you want to communicate with. Uh, when you're publishing an academic journal, you're really telling your story, uh, sharing the work that you did, sharing what you discovered uh, to a specific audience. So you need to consider who that audience is. Uh, are you uh, speaking towards uh, your, your local constituents, your, your patrons uh, uh, within your organization? Are you uh, speaking towards a, a regional group, uh, maybe within your country, um, or, or do you want to speak more to an international audience? Uh, so that's an important first choice in choosing a journal uh, and whether you want to choose an international academic journal or something that might be more local 
uh, or even less academic in scope. Other things to consider uh, are, are how that how people will access the work. Um, you need to consider whether or not the journal is open access, uh, and if if the people who you want to communicate with would have be able to, to find uh, and use that work. Uh, and that also uh, counts towards the, the metrics of the journal. You need to consider um, the impact of that journal, how wide uh, the audience is, uh, what their readership is, uh, and how those articles are used uh, in research. Uh, so I would suggest as you're choosing your journal, uh, take a look at recent issues um, and see, uh, are, the, are these the types of works that I would like to, uh, to be involved with? Uh, is this the conversation I want to join? Uh, also, uh, read the guidelines for authors. Uh, make sure uh, what you're planning to do, what you're writing, the type of research you're doing fits those guidelines fits the, the, the other papers you see. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, email the editor or email someone on the editorial board uh, and ask them uh, about the process uh, or even about your project and how it might fit uh, that journal. Uh, and you should do this uh, for IFLA journal or for any other journal you're thinking about uh, submitting your work to. So specifically uh, with IFLA Journal, uh, our aims uh, and scope uh, are as an international peer-reviewed uh, journal for library information science. Um, and within that, we focus broadly on LIS, uh, but also oh, focus to... on social, political, and economic uh, issues that uh, impact access to information for libraries you guys to stay out of the way and I need you to stay quiet and out of his way. Uh, um, what is Ava and Lola doing? I'm sorry, uh, can everybody mute their microphones, please? I love you. Yes, you raise it. Um, uh, so, uh, we are an international uh, peer-reviewed journal, um, and we seek to reflect the values of IFLA. Uh, we view the profession and its practices uh, from both within a, a local uh, and global context. Uh, so it's important to, th to think about how your work might contribute uh, to those conversations. Uh, in addition, uh, we seek research and commentary that, that attempts to navigate between uh, the global and the local uh, to produce research that's relevant uh, to, to people across the profession uh, and revolves around uh, what scholars describe as traces that suggest the relations between local and global frames of reference, uh, which means uh, if you're talking about something specific to a local institution, uh, you need to relate that to global phenomenon, uh, other issues. Uh, within the field so that, that an international audience uh, can appreciate it. Uh, so why would one uh, want to publish an IFLA journal? Uh, first, uh, we have a global reader readership. Uh, every organization and institution uh, within IFLA uh, receives a subscription to IFLA Journal, both print uh, and digital. Um, uh, this means we reach uh, most countries around the world uh, and have a, have, a, have a tremendous reach in uh, the global south uh, and, and developing countries as well. Uh, our work is accessible uh, since we uh, translate the abstracts into seven languages uh, so that uh, scholars uh, uh, have broad access to, to what's in the, the journal. Um, and we also are, have uh, open access policies which allow uh, the author to publish uh, an accepted manuscript into their own 
uh, institutional archive without an embargo. Uh, in addition, articles are published on SAGE online. Uh, so they're indexed uh, in Scopus, indexed in Web of Science, amongst other places. Uh, and when we publish, we simultaneously publish uh, open access uh, on the IFLA website. So, so there are multiple ways in which your, your work uh, will be accessible. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the types of submissions that we seek uh, within IFLA Journal, uh, similar to many other uh, academic articles, we, we seek uh, original research. Um, uh, and within our journal specifically, uh, we seek original research that recognizes that their design and analysis um, uh, uh, is operating at multiple conceptual spatial levels uh, that's relevant to their study. Uh, this means you, you need to make attempts to discuss uh, and reference both uh, the importance and significance uh, of the, your local context, uh, but also its connections to broader global structures uh, that impact uh, and relate to your topic. Uh, we also accept review articles. Um, those should, again, document uh, important works and figures within the area, recent advances, current debates, but also identify gaps uh, in, in future directions for research on that topic. Um, we increasingly receive case studies, uh, which are more qualitative uh, in nature. Uh, and I should remind you that case studies should not be uh, journalistic in nature or, or simply a description of the work uh, or projects done within your library, um, but they should try to create routes towards understanding uh, the uniqueness of that case uh, and how it relates uh, to other phenomenon within, within the field um, and how that's been adapted locally or responded to locally. Uh, so that we can all learn from that case. Right. And finally, we also accept essays, uh, which Enough provide uh, informed analysis and viewpoints, uh, trends, uh, controversies within the field. Uh, so essays can contribute uh, an important conceptual analysis of policies that impact and contribute to the information environment uh, as it uh, affects the profession locally and globally. Uh, and finally, as you're thinking of submitting, um, keep in mind that the article length is typically between three and 8,000 words. Um, as I mentioned, we, we accept a range of research approaches, uh, both qualitative and quantitative and mixed methods as well, uh, diverse topics from within the field. Uh, and you should also keep your eye out for special issues. We, we try to publish one or two special issues each year um, right now, uh, we're putting into press the special issue on indigenous librarianship uh, and are finalizing work on a special issue on COVID-19 uh, and library responses. Uh, and th there'll be further special issues coming uh, over the years. Um, so if you're, you're interested in submitting, um, uh, submissions are accepted online uh, through the link listed here. And if you have questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And I'll uh, stop sharing my screen here and uh, we'll be ready for our next speaker. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it was a very, very uh, good, uh, in a good sense that uh, you gave us uh, what we should do and what we don't have to do when we want to publish our scientific communication on a journal and what uh, is the expected expectation of IFLA journal and so thank you all thanks a lot and we are, are going for the next uh, speaker that is Dr. Uh, Debbie Rabina from Pratt's Institute. Debbie the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Egbert, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, 
I, uh, I'm going to cover uh, a few things from a reviewer's perspective. I have been a reviewer for Ifriddle Journal for a number of years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the review process more generally. Um, and then I'm going to talk more about how I actually approach a, um, a, review, a paper when I review it, what it is that I look at, what my work is, um, and just kind of general what some of the things that are going through the minds of your reviewers as we are looking at your manuscripts. Um, hmm. Okay, um, so as was mentioned, my name is Debbie Rabina. I am a professor at Pratt Institute School of uh, Information in New York City. Um, the areas that I teach and research and more important for this session review in uh, would be areas of information policy and law, government information, literacy, scholarly communication, digitization, critical theory, and just in general social science research methods. Um, I realize after I put the slides in that this is not really helpful, but I'm sure that if anyone has any questions, uh, you can find my email and you're welcome to contact me. Um, being a reviewer also, by the way, kind of begs the question of why people take on the job of reviewing. Um, reviewers don't really get any compensation or any real kind of like acknowledgement for the work. Um, so it is in many ways a labor of love. Um, and I would say that people do this um, in different stages in their career for different reasons. Uh, probably reviewers that are er in early stages of the career are more interested in learning the lay of the land and like seeing both sides of the process, both as authors and as the reviewers. Uh, for people that are in later stages of the career, such as myself, um, it is really kind of more of a service to the profession. Um, it's a question of mentoring. Um, it's a question of kind of passing on the knowledge that we have accumulated over the years uh, so that other people can benefit, uh, learn, and then pass it on. Um, so the review process um, is basically uh, kind of like a pretty simple thing. You write a paper, other people read it. Um, you two, pe two people will read your, um, your work in order to see if it meets the standards that are required for publication. It is a review process rather than a grading process. So what we offered are really more like comments. Um, and we are assessing this really for appropriate appropriateness for the journal rather than absolute good or bad. Um, so that means that your manuscript might not be appropriate for IFLA journal, but it could be appropriate for another journal, or it could be more appropriate for another section of a journal rather than, you know, it's not original research, it's more like an editorial um, or things like that. Um, it's important to remember because the comments often feel a little punishing and sometimes critical, um, but it is really more feedback than it would be grading per se. Um, this is a, a diagram of what the review process looks like. Um, you, of course, as Steve mentioned, you will write your manuscript and submit it through the IFLA uh, website. Um, when you submit, it goes to the editor and the editor does kind of like a first look at it. And the first look really is just checking it to see, is, does this fall within the scope of the journal? The scope of the journal, whether it's by subject or the length of the manuscript um, or the research methods that you used in your manuscript. Once the editor decides that it is within scope and worthy of a review, um, the editor finds uh, reviewers that are within that knowledge domain and will send them to the reviewers. Um, this is, you know, as you probably all know, or if you don't, you might find out, um, the, re the review process can often be long. And, and, and I would say that this is a little bit of a bottleneck when it comes to the reviewers, because um, reviewing is, uh, it's kind of like tends to sometimes fall at the end of our to-do list because many of us teach and we have 
you know, classes to prepare and grades and things like that. Um, we, I think, are allowed three weeks for review, um, which is reasonable and, you know, usually we, we do that. Um, I have learned as an author um, that I tend to get comments back kind of like at the end of semester before before Christmas, at the end of summer, um, when a lot of times that's kind of like when the reviewers get to it. Um, the next step that you will get after you receive reviewers' comments, um, you will usually be asked to revise. I will talk a little bit about that more. Um, once you are asked to make some corrections, you will resubmit. Um, there might be two iterations, sometimes three iterations of resubmitting, um, but um, and then you will usually get more comments with either an acceptance or a rejection uh, notification, and then it will be published online. And finally, and there is a lag between the online publication and the print publication, but for all purposes of you being able to share your, um, your work, once it is online, it is available for you and you can you know, add it to your resume or CV and so on. Um, so we said the, the review process is really a form of quality control. Um, it, is, um, it looks for things also like language and spelling and uh, just like the general flow of the, of the paper and really does help us determine if this is appropriate for the purposes and the topics that IFLA journal covers. Um, so again, this is kind of uh, what it is that we do. We look at the scope, we look if it's clearly formulated, if it flows right. Um, the, IFLA publishes social science research and in social science research, methodology is really key. Like we look at the methods and we looked at the research methods that you used and what one of the first things that I kind of look at is I ask myself, are these research methods the appropriate methods to answer the research question that the authors presented? Um, when we talk about social science research, um, methods are key. So, you know, that's kind of like different from when we talk about a science paper, where one of the things that you're looking for is, can you reproduce this study? If I take your data and recreate it, will I come to the same conclusion? Um, in social science, we don't really look at that. What we look at really are the methods appropriate for answering the question. Is this something that should be answered um, with a survey, with a focus group? That is a lot of what I'm looking for. Um, in addition, I'm kind of looking at the significance of this work. Does this work really, um, is it of interest to the general public? Will it promote knowledge and scholarship in this area? Um, is it also, um, is it, conducted in an ethical way, meaning um, was the data collected in a transparent way? Were the people, um, the research subjects provided with informed consent? Um, and again, I have another slide that talks about this. I have to say that plagiarism, if it occurs, maybe Steve kind of like catches it way before I do. Um, I personally have not really come across plagiarism as too much of a problem. Um, I will add though, that it's not so much plagiarism that I run into, but sometimes um, it, is, it is really a question of writing that when things are a little unclear, especially in that transition between literature review and discussion, and it is often not clear to me if you are still presenting the literature review or if this is now your original discussion. Um, and that is really a question of, of academic writing more than it is a question of plagiarism. So we have, there's several types of review and if the journal uses double blind review, which means that the reviewer is unknown to the author and the author is unknown to me. Um, this requires the authors to prepare the manuscript in a way that will 
conceal their identity. Um, so that means that if you <clears throat> are quoting uh, prior research that you had published, um, you must anonymize that and take um, that out. If you are relating to a very specific location that might give away your identity, you should also, also anonymize that. Um, it is becoming increasingly hard to be to remain um, completely anonymous in the age where you can kind of Google everything and there are many ways, many clues there. I personally don't think that it matters that much. I'm not really concerned with it. Um, I also kind of find that the more um, established one is as a researcher, it is more difficult to really remain completely anonymous in this process. Um, so kind of getting into what it is that I look at when I receive your manuscript. Uh, when Steve sends me a manuscript to review, I receive an email and the email will have your title and the abstract. Um, and then the question that I ask is based on this abstract, do I feel that I am able um, to um, to review your paper? So before I see your paper and before I accept the review, um, task, all I see is the abstract. Um, and to me, one of the really, is, and, and the abstract kind of like tells me if, if this is my area of expertise and if I can really do a good job reviewing your paper. One of the things that I really look for is some is how well your title and your abstract match up. One of the things that I have found over the years is that people tend to have um, titles that are very broad, uh, more general, um, while their abstracts are more specific to a location or a situation. Um, so it will be, um, so there's a little bit of, in terms of like research methods, it seems that authors try to kind of provide some kind of like generalization for the title that is not really available um, in the abstract. So that's kind of like one thing that happens. And, and for me, that's kind of like a first sort of red flag. Um, so, you know, let's say all is well and I have accepted the task. And I would say that I accept probably most of the um, ones that are sent my way. Once I start reviewing your paper, I will have several tabs open on my on my computer. The first one is, of course, your manuscript, which I get as a PDF, um, which is really um, a blessing because like everyone else, we kind of have, like I'm a reviewer, I am not a copy editor, but the, the, the temptation to start copy editing and correcting typos and grammar mistakes is great. So the fact that it's a PDF kind of makes that um, a little more difficult for me so I can resist that temptation. Um, the other thing that I will have open is a review form. And in the review form, I am basically asked to look at, to answer two general questions. The first one, is the submission a significant contribution in terms of knowledge or information conveyed? Um, so that means your paper may be great, but it doesn't really add a lot or change a lot or make a great contribution um, to the information field or to library information science. Uh, we're asked to consider, does this advance knowledge? Is this high level of scholarship? Um, is this an original contribution? Is there new information or data in your submission? And the second question that we are asked to consider when reviewing is, is this submission, submission sound in terms of the methods, the findings, and the structure? Um, basically, again, meaning, does this follow um, the template or the flow of a social science research paper? Um, so again, if this was a humanities paper, you usually start your paper with you know, an uppercase letter, and then you kind of like write 5,000 words, and then you have a full stop, and that's the end. Whereas social science research papers um, tend to be, um, you know, we have an introduction and a literature review and a method section and our findings and discussions and conclusions. And that is the structure that I am looking at, I am looking for. Um, 
So I will also have Google open because I always end up using it, whether it's to clarify a term that was used that I am not familiar with um, or whatever may else come my way. And the other thing that I have open on my tabs is Pratt Library website. Um, and that is for, again, looking at the literature review. Sometimes there are things that people cite in the literature review that seem to me need, I, I want to verify them or I want to check or I want to, they, they they may sound familiar or I may think they missed something, uh, whatever the case may be, those will usually be the four tabs that I have open when I'm reviewing papers. Um, I, I usually have the sidebar of the PDF of your manuscript open and I don't, before I even start reading like your paper from start to finish, I kind of glance at the sidebar and I look at the layout um, and I look to see how much text there is. Is there a bibliography? Are there tables? Are there any appendices? So, you know, then when I'm reading your methods and I see something like questionnaires were handed out, I can look at the appendix and see, do you have a draft of the questions that you provided um, your users or your research subjects? Um, so that's kind of, you know, the beginning of how I look at the paper. Um, I, I was trying to think earlier how long it takes me. I don't always do this in one sitting, um, but I don't know. I want to say that maybe four to five hours, depending on, on the depending on the manuscript and how much time I have to spend looking at some of the literature uh, would probably be an average time. Um, sometimes I would like look at something, um, kind of like think about it for a few days and come back to it. Most often I do it in two sittings rather than one. Um, so, you know, once I have read all of this, um, and I got the impression, then I kind of like go back and I ask all of the hard questions. Um, and the hard questions are really kind of, it's not often, is this a good paper or a bad paper? It really is, why do I care about this? Why would my readers care about this? And how is this going to advance knowledge and scholarship in our field? Um, and papers may be really good, but they will often be somewhat redundant or may repeat things that are already known and obvious. Um, so that might be a good paper, but not necessarily of, of interest, or it could be very narrow to a specific situation that is not widely, that will not be widely appreciated. Um, I also look at how well written it is, um, meaning not only does it flow and is it clear, um, our IFLA is an international journal, a lot of the terms or a lot of the geographies that are used are not familiar to me or to your readers. Um, there is a fine line between over explaining but providing enough information so somebody who is not familiar will will be able to immerse themselves in what it is that you're writing about. So again, those will be some of the things that I look at. Um, I look a lot at the research methods and ask myself if the research methods um, are appropriate for the paper. And I found over the years that some research methods that should be used tend to be underused. Um, the ones that are underused would really be more um, anthropological methods um, that are kind of the papers that Steve spoke about, which are some type of case study that might be more appropriate to approach this as more of an anthropological paper. Um, I find that critical research methods are underused also. Well, some of the things that are overused tend to be really extensive descriptive statistics, a lot of use of a lot of statistics and statistic analysis, including uh, what statistics, but also kind of um, kind of content analysis also, um, very often using software on samples that are rather small and that don't necessarily benefit from, um, from using so many statistical applications on them. 
Um, the samples are often small and don't really require so much. Um, I did not add this. It's it kind of like missed my slides, or maybe it's in another slide. Um, but I think that um, one one thing that I also see that is maybe not overused but underexplained are comparative studies. Um, and comparative studies usually compare different geographies. So if you are comparing country A to country B, I often find that people do this as some kind of form of convenience, uh, meaning they are from country A and they are currently residing or studying in country B. And it's it, it there is a convenience in comparing the two. Um, but that for me is not enough. They're kind of just because you are familiar with two countries or because two countries have users of a different of a certain type doesn't lend itself naturally to comparison. Um, there has to be something um, that is more theoretically um, mutual to these things that you are comparing um, before they really lend themselves well to compare to comparison to comparison. I will also say that comparative studies are very hard to pull off and um, and people, um, kind of um, tend to, I guess, again, again, overuse them or think that they are easier than they actually are. Oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, just kind of like a list of some best practices of things that you should consider before you're submitting your manuscript. The first thing is to read before you write or before you submit, or if you decide in advance that you are writing this manuscript for IFLA journal, um, you have to read the submission guidelines and you have to read them multiple times. Anything from the recommended length to the citation style um, to you know whatever it is that um, um, that the journal requires, um, just make sure that you read them before you submit. Ethics is of course important. Plagiarism, as I said, it's not something that I have come across a lot. Most of the plagiarism, most of what I kind of see as possible plagiarism is really sort of more unintentional omissions that might occur in the literature review or just lack of clarity about when you, when you are done quoting someone or paraphrasing someone to when you are now starting to add your own uh, view of the topic. Um, things like informed consent are again, you know, every country might have different um, like review boards that require um, that require informed consent. I know that this is not an internationally agreed upon. Um, as was mentioned uh, earlier, I think, or maybe not, COPE, which is a committee on promoting publication ethics, um, has guidelines, and, and IFLA follow, follows Co uh, COPE um, guidelines um, about best practices for, uh, for publication ethics. Copyrights and permissions, if you are quoting something that will require copyright, not if you are not in your literature review, you do not need permissions for that, but if you are reproducing an image from a book or a poem or things like that that might require permission, um, those are things that you should probably have in advance. If not, you will be notified from our editorial board. Um, you know, I am a reviewer and I am one reviewer and each reviewer has their own idiosyncrasies. Um, but then again, since I, all, I always see what the other reviewer said about your article, um, then I know that while there are idi idiosyncrasies, there are also a lot of, um, you know, there's more like an and than an or among reviewers. Um, and while we tend to sometimes phrase things differently, um, we definitely tend to agree more generally on, on what it is that your, um, that, your, that your paper you know, is or what the review is. Um, so when I'm talking about- Two more minutes. 
Oh, wow, sorry. Okay, um, so kind of the, some of the things that I see, a lot of the things that will be the large, a lot of times your study will just confirm earlier studies, meaning that there isn't really anything new that you are adding to that. Um, another thing is like a confusion between methods and methodology. I don't know if these slides will be available. I, I have an article here that kind of talks a little bit about the difference. Um, statistical overkill, which I mentioned. Um, another kind of thing that I see is uh, people often say that they are developing a model. Developing a model takes a lot of work. Um, just because you have a diagram doesn't mean that this is necessarily a model. Um, a model often takes years of research. Um, so, you know, very often I see models that aren't really models. Um, and the final pet peeve that I have is really a use of, of passive voice and third person, um, which kind of, you know, makes it a little um, challenging for me um to know when it's you and when it is the literature review uh finally i just want to say a little bit a word about your revised manuscript when you receive your first round back with comments for the author and you make those corrections and send them back it is very important for me that you add something that really clarifies how it is that you addressed each co each co each comment from the reviewer, and if you are so you will say you know I, and I gave this example here. This is a comment, and then you will say I addressed it this this way, or you can also say you know I disagree or I don't think that, and then just explain why you disagree with my comment. Um, sometimes you will not be able to, to make that correction because it will require collecting new data um, or things like that. Um, so I hope I'm still within my two minutes. Um, I am ready. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions either through the chat or if you want to email me, feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, uh, for this wonderful talk and a very, very extensive and explicit uh, way of doing things and to revise a document. Now we are going with uh, Sherry Ann Smart, and the floor is yours, Sherry Ann, please. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Egbert, will you be advancing my slides? Okay. Um, I don't have a lot. Um, Great, thanks. Okay. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I promise not to bear it. So I've structured my presentation to encourage questions, feedbacks, comments, etc. Um, much of what I have to say is based on my own personal experience. So um, I'm putting this disclaimer out right away that it isn't necessarily the view of IFLA or IFLA Juma. So, um, Edward, could you go back to the first slide, I think, to the beginning? Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about the non-traditional authors. And by non-traditional authors, I'm looking at persons who are not necessarily employed in academia but have an interest in, 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 in scholarly publications. Um, there's just one up. It's fine. Well, actually, this is about the third slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. I, um, up to three years ago, I was an academic librarian. I'm now in my own practice in that I'm an independent researcher, an entrepreneur, I'm a business person, all right? I'm still actively engaged in scholarly publication and also working with researchers who need the assistance 
and are uh, quite prepared to pay for that service instead of sometimes approaching their academic librarians. So when I talk about non-traditional um, authors, I'm speaking about people like myself, um, people who are not, you know, probably sometimes school librarians or people who feel they may not always be adequately represented within the research space. So, um, Edward? You can yes. talk that one. Yeah, you can. That one you had before is fine. Then. Okay. So could we? Oh. All right. So I've spoken about myself and my research interests. Yes. Okay. So from the non-traditional perspective, you would often ask yourself, what should I write about? Why should I write about it? How do I address that pesky ethical review process? And is IFLA Journal the appropriate publishing outlet for me? If we look at, next slide please, Egbert. If we look at the, the IFLA scope, mm -hmm. topics of interest, number five. Okay. Okay, great. All right. So if you look at the IFLA scope, you will note, and I've highlighted some areas here, that it addresses, IFLA is an international journal that publishes peer-reviewed articles on library and information services and the social, political, and economic issues that impact access to information through libraries. Now I'm looking at that phrase and I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting to us sometimes that we need to take it literally and figuratively as it relates to the information that we want to, to talk about or what, or what we consider topics of interest in our particular space. Now, IFLA Journal is also the official journal of IFLA, which is an international institution and its readership is also international. So it addresses not only academic institutions, but also professional organizations and IFLA members. So it is from that aspect is why I'm suggesting um, when we talk about non-traditional authors, that this is a scope that we can look at in terms of also contributing to the profession. There's often an erroneous perception, in my view, that academic librarians are the only producers of content. However, the reality is that they have access to only a small population of persons who can afford post-secondary education. If we are to test the efforts of our literacy programs, then we need to also research the efforts of university alumni and also the 90% of the population who constitute our stakeholders in education, business, government, scientists, thinkers, and the slew of persons under the Sustainable Development Goal, for instance. Cutting edge research is not limited to what occurs in universities. So there is, there is room for the non-traditional author who is often poised at the cost of really interesting material based on what they're doing and what they may find the, the areas they, might, they may find themselves exposed to. So could we advance please, um, Edward? So what should I write about? What should I write about and why should I write about it? As a, a non-traditional author, I, I, let me talk about my own experience. You find yourself um, having to do private consultations, as I said, with, with faculty. Faculty, you have access to to government institutions or also um, private citizens. You also have access to private corporations who may need your services, but they're not necessarily, and it's specifically as it relates to the Caribbean as to who they can approach to get certain things done. I've had among my clientele, and I think my clientele would, about the third of my clientele, for instance, would consist of alumni from the university. They're interested in publishing, they're interested in research, but they're outside of the university system. So there isn't much um, 
opportunities for them to get the assistance they would have gotten from their librarians had they still been university, um, students at the university. So these are areas I'm thinking that DIFLA for itself and in terms of how we think as librarians that we have to think about these hybrid models. So for people who, like myself, if you're tired of getting splinters and you, you seem sometimes to be swimming um, upstream within the formal setting that there are opportunities outside there where you can you can add um, value and you can make a contribution to your to your profession. So why should I write about it? The same reasons we we, we say for the academic librarians. Um, it's important to share research with researchers, with other researchers, um, in using or exploring topics of interest that advance knowledge, that improve our world, that develop our country, and provide solutions and resolutions. Some of the benefits we get, for me, I could talk about in private practice, is that it promotes and advances your business model. You'll find a lot of times that when you're working with um, other researchers, there is value in that you're also researching and that you're also publishing. So that's one benefit. You will find that when you're working with entities, whether it's government or even in the private sector, that they are also interested in persons who, who are not just talking and just not just you know, doing really great presentations, but actually that you are walking the, the talk so that you know what you're talking about because they can look at your CV and they can see that you're an active researcher in, in whatever um, field. So some of the other benefits, apart from self-gratification, there's also that issue of royalties for, for, for persons who are interested in book publishing. There's royalties on your books. And particularly as it relates to Jamaica, um, we do have the, the Jamaica Copyright Association that if you're a member, at the end of the year, you do get some royalty from your publication. So there is a fiscal benefit also for publishing. Next slide, please, I put. Yeah, okay. So how do you satisfy these ethical requirements for persons who are outside of academia and may be interested in, for instance, um, submitting work on, in, in, in the areas of social sciences? One, there's an opportunity to partner with institutional librarians, um, whether it's at a university or hospital, and in that, in that way, the, the person who is employed at university can go through their IRB and apply for permission. There's also an opportunity, as Debbie mentioned, to expand your research design. You know, um, librarians, I suppose, because we are positivists or positivists, post-positivists, that we do a lot of statistics. But you know, there are opportunities for us to expand what we do. So even if you're doing quantitative research or qualitative, qualitative research or mixed method, there are a lot of underused techniques and there are a lot of other methods that you can use, for instance, document analysis, that falls within the, these wider designs that would enable you to publish without having to get um, ethical approval. There's also an option to conduct low risk research. For instance, published biographies, newspapers, accounts, or you can do literature or systematic reviews or conceptual or theoretical analysis. Um, Debbie made mention of that. Sometimes there are a lot of overused concepts in the, in the literature. And a lot of that is because there isn't a lot of um, um, new works. In the Caribbean, and I could speak to when I was going through my dissertation process, it was very, very difficult to find works that use or that was published on our Caribbean system. Very, very difficult. So it's an opportunity for us, especially I think for the developing countries where we can make a difference um, with respect to our publishing efforts. Next slide, please, Edward. Edward? Okay. So is the IFLA journal appropriate for that research outlet? I saw a quote this morning by William Arthur Ward. It said, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. Every manuscript I have submitted to IFLA has inspired me to the point, to the point that I'm at currently. 
I've had wonderful reviewers who have inspired. You know, they haven't shut down the, my ideas. They have not managed to quell my spirit as it relates to suggesting sometimes. And I've seen that in reviews when you work with clients that they are trying to, to get you to shift to think a particular way when that's not the direction you want to go in. And this is also, you know, as it relates to when you're working with clients who have alumni, I should say, um, from the universities. When they're in that setting, a lot of times there are other influences. So they publish things, you know, because sometimes the process is long and they need to get out of there. But when they are, they're, they're through and that passion is still burning, you will find that they're still interested in doing research, whether and I'm not so in this instance, I'm not necessarily talking about librarians, but in terms of helping other persons with their research output. So um, coming back though to my experience with the, the peer reviewers at IFLA, um, my last paper, the reviewer was so great at, at you know, not being inclined to submit anything else because I mean, I'm still salivating on those wonderful comments she gave that encouraged me to do a little bit more research. And, and you know, knowledge is something that once you gain this, you know, no one can ever take it away from you. So, for the peer reviewers at, at IFLA, I, I, you know, I give a shout out because they have been able to, to fulfill that function in terms of educating and informing. The other thing I've found with, with research and um, I'm putting a plug out there for persons who are in the non-traditional field is the opportunity for us as, as librarians, as professionals, that we identify and resolve problems from it in. So our research, for instance, is supposed to address some of the issues that we are encountering in our own profession. You know, sometimes I'm dis disheartened and you know, there's a lot of discussion sometimes about the toxic work environment. And you're gonna see librarians publishing in other areas. So they, they publish in human resource journals, they publish in management journals, they publish in other journals. Yet we understand that there are issues in our own profession and if you, if you did a search, you will see very, very little information about it. So um, it is my, my view that the professional journal should also serve that purpose to identify and resolve problems that we may encounter. So it's not about just coexisting and presenting devolutionary ideas, it's also about presenting evolutionary topics. It's also about um, reinventing ourselves, especially within, you know, um, we have the pandemic, for instance, that is forcing us to think and operate and function in a particular way. And it's also about how we, we identify ourselves and how how we, 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 we not just coexist again, but how we come together to really serve our stakeholders in this new environment. And I think that's my last slide. Is that it, Gilbert? Thank you very much. At this point, I wanna thank you for listening and I am very curious to hear any um, comments or questions or views that you may have about this. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry Ann, for, for this wonderful talk and for the vision, and also to encourage us to keep on going and to write in professional journals. And also, uh, really, uh, that great uh, hand that you gave to the reviewers. And sometimes that kind of work is not so much uh, very not so much estimated by uh, writers. So. Uh, we opened uh, our uh, session for some uh, feedbacks or questions, or at the same time uh, in the chat, you can uh, uh, send your question and we will, and we will deliver it to our uh, panelists, our speakers. So um, at this time, uh, there is uh, some question about the open access and also what we are talking about some repositories. And so uh, if our paper is accepted by the journal, uh, which uh, version of uh, the manuscript can we deposit in uh, our institutional repository? 
I can answer that question, Egbert. Um, once your uh, paper is accepted, you can deposit the, the final accepted version of that manuscript into your repository. Um, uh, so you can publish, put that in the repository uh, right away. Uh, the version that is published by SAGE um, will be published open access on the IFLA website. Um, and then also it will be published by SAGE in the print and digital versions uh, of the journal. Okay, thank you, Steve. And uh, for, for Debbie, uh, what is the, the most difficult uh, moment of the reviewing process as a reviewer? What is the most difficult uh, moment of the reviewing process for you? Sorry, You're I was muted. muted. Um, yeah, um, you know, I think writing the comments in a way that is constructive criticism but won't be crushing uh, to read um, is something that I'm very mindful of. Uh, you know, we grow very attached to our writing and people kind of take it personally when you critique um, what it is that they wrote. And, you know, very often, even if a manuscript needs a lot of work, there is a core there that is of interest. Um, so for me, I try to kind of ask myself how I would feel if I received these comments. Um, and I try to write them in a way that will both be detailed enough so that the author can really take my comments and kind of revise accordingly. Um, but that really, um, it's kind of like the tough love approach, I guess, uh, to reviewing. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, and for Sherian, which uh, moment or during the, this whole process is the most difficult for an author to end the not in the reviewing pro in the process for sending the pay the manuscript or paper to a journal what is the most difficult moment or a kind of decision making to which journal should i send my paper thank you Edward. i have found in my experience with, with um working with, with, with authors is that people don't read the scope and the aims and scope of the journal carefully. Um, so sometimes you never know what, if it's a chicken and egg situation. Should I target a journal and then write a paper specifically for that journal? Or should I write any paper and then I try to find a journal? And then when people do it that way, there are certain other things that they look at. So they're gonna look at the, um, the ranking, they're gonna look at the, the H index, they look at um, the publishing speed. There's other things in the process that they look at instead of sometimes looking at their paper and see whether their paper is a good fit for that particular, for that particular journal. I think that you would, you would identify with that. You know, um, you know, sometimes when people talk about the peer review process, one of the things they always, always say it's almost like a standard, you know, I would review the paper the way I would like, the comments I would like to receive. There are some people who are quite matter of fact and you can be very rude to them and they don't care. So, so their, their, their review is, is very, very rude. I've gotten something sometimes I wonder, um, you know, if you weren't wrong within this profession, you would leave it because, you know, um, some of the comments are just so negative. So, I, 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 but I take your point that it is sometimes very, very difficult to, to, um, to do constructive feedback on some papers that you may perceive may not, you know, be such a great fit. Um. Okay, and there's uh, another question. There are two questions. If uh, if the journal is uh, is thinking to to prepare a special issue uh, in the next. Uh, the next few months or in the next years, uh, the next year. And another question, uh, Dere, uh, from, uh, from uh, one uh, attendees is uh, if, uh, if a journal, we, uh, he can publish 
a systematic review of medicine as well. I, I leave it open to you. I, I can answer, I think, both of those. Um, yeah, regarding the special issues, um, we're working on several right now. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we have one on indigenous librarianship and another focused on uh, library responses to COVID. Uh, there are two other special issues, one on preservation, uh, which is in the, the editing process right now. Uh, and we're also editing uh, and reviewing papers for a special issue on uh, freedom and access to information. Um, uh, so we're, we don't have other special issues specifically under development. We, we hope to have some ideas come through uh, this summer. Uh, typically, we identify themes for special issues during our meetings uh, in August at the IFLA Congress uh, and through dialogue and conversations with section leaders and, and people involved uh, in IFLA. So um, that process could be disrupted a bit because we're in a virtual conference this year and won't be walking around and chatting with people um, in the same way. So if people have ideas and suggestions for special issues, I'd, I'd appreciate hearing from you. We, we try to um, identify those through the, the membership and through the professional committees so that, so that we're highlighting issues that are important to the IFLA uh, members. Okay, thank you, Steve. And uh, the last question, uh, what is the acceptance rate of IFLA journal? Uh, this is the most, uh, uh, I, I think that everyone wants to know that. Mm -hmm. um, our acceptance rate is about the, you know, the, the same as, as our peer journals in the field. Uh, I think about 30% of submitted papers are accepted. Um, uh, uh, so, it, you know, I think that's typical of, of many academic journals. Um, we, we receive a, quite a few papers that, that might be considered out of scope um, and don't make it into the review process. Um, and I, I guess I forgot to answer the question on the medical uh, review. Um, uh, we don't uh, take pa papers on, on health or medical sciences unless they're focused on health information, uh, information seeking behaviors, um, or uh, the ways in which libraries, uh, information profession professionals help uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, information to, to, to people regarding health issues uh, or developing health knowledge. Uh, so I, I suspect we would not accept a paper that's a kind of a, a, a review of medical research unless it's a review of uh, related to information science and, and information seeking and, and the role of libraries in that uh, domain. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, my last word for this is uh, to thank you all. Uh, Debbie, Sherry Ann, Steve, uh, Shelly Shang, and also uh, Megan, and all those wonderful uh, IFLA staff that has uh, supported us to have this webinar. And I think uh, that uh, we have a, a great uh, expectation and we, we are willing to, to have your papers and also uh, we are willing to, to review them and to have a great, great uh, IFLA journal. I think uh, everything it's, uh, it's nice and everything uh, what we have is to communicate and to communicate in the best way. And I think the IFLA journal is a journal that can give us a wide, uh, a wide view of what is going on in every country and what is going, uh, what every uh, colleague are doing in their country that is interest of the, the whole community. Uh, 
this is my last word. Uh, many thanks to all of you and have a great evening. 